we have everyone back. Everyone good with audio? I think so. Uh, I think so. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the special edition Dawn Hangout. Uh, this is series, Great Expectations. So this is part two in our series series. Yes, we are calling it that because why not? Uh, I am Nicole Gallucci. I am postdoc with the CosmoQuest uh, Citizen Science Project, and I am joined by Brittany Schmidt from Georgia Tech. Hello. And uh, I also have Whitney Cobb here from the Dawn EPO mission team, and uh, she will be helping us track comments. Uh, and our two special guests today are Katie Dill. Hello. So hello, Katie. Uh, and Andy Rifkin. Hi. And they are going to be telling us a little bit more about how we know what we know about asteroids and series uh, and uh, why we're so excited to be getting uh, the Dawn Spacecraft 2 series in early 2015. Uh, so I want to let you guys know if you want to send in questions or comments for everyone here in the show, there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you're on Twitter, you can tweet at NASA underscore Dawn, uh, and so we'll be monitoring that, answering questions there, as well as sending them along to the Hangout. You can use the event page on Google Plus uh, for questions there, or you can use the YouTube comments if you're watching this on YouTube, and we will be monitoring all those places. So uh, feel free to join in the conversation and ask any questions as we go along. Uh, so why don't we get started right off with Brittany. wanted to give us a brief overview of, of Dawn. Uh, and how it relates to series. Sure. So it's a pleasure to be joining you guys again. Uh, last week or last time we uh, we chatted, uh, I got to tell you a little bit about um, kind of my my interests in series. Um, and today we've got two really great experts and friends of mine. Um, Andy Rivkin is at Johns Hopkins um, Advanced. I'm sorry, Applied Physics Laboratory. So in uh, in Maryland, and Katie Dill, uh, who is actually a UCLA grad who is now um, doing a postdoc at Curtin University in Perth, Australia. So um, Katie is a meteoriticist and Andy is a spectroscopist and they both study uh, asteroids and the early solar system using a variety of different tools. So we thought they'd be really great perspectives to share um, the story of Ceres and what we're looking forward to with Dawn. But um, for those of you who may be new to, uh, to the Dawn mission, um, it is a spacecraft that has just finished up a little over a year of observations of asteroid Vesta. It's actually the first spacecraft that's gone to one target and then left that target and gone on to orbit another one. So we're actually um, in the middle of our flight to Ceres, which as we mentioned, we'll, we'll get to Ceres in early 2015. Uh, Dawn is a, a, an international mission that actually involves uh, investigators from the United States, um, from Italy, from Germany, um, and then a lot of, a lot of uh, people invested across, uh, across the United States as well. Um, so really great, um, awesome little mission. Um, we're really excited to be bringing you the story of the science and um, kind of our outlook as we, as we head into series. So um, with no further ado, I, I'd love for the scientists to just go ahead and take over. Okay. Um... I don't know which uh, whether it makes sense for, for me to go first or Katie. Um, sure, go alphabetical. <laughs> by which first or last name? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I uh, use telescopes to uh, look at, at uh, asteroids mostly, um, and to look at the composition. And we're uh, going to, I guess, talk about mostly the composition of Ceres and some other asteroids today. Um, so mostly I use telescopes. So, you know, I, I stay up all night doing that, and, of course, it's night nighttime in Australia, so, you know, nobody's <laughs> awake when they necessarily want to be awake. Um, so the first, I guess, the, the first thing to show would be uh, spectrum explanation human range. If you can slap that up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell if you have or not, but... Um, There you go. All right. So uh, sunlight, uh, and I guess all light, when in a sense, could be split into various colors. You know, people who have the old Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon, you know, there's the prism, and the, the white light comes in, and the rainbow comes out. Um, and you can uh, measure light by the, uh, the measure different colors by the energy that, that the, the associated color, that's associated with that color. Um, 
and that's kind of shown along the the bottom of the plot here wavelength um, it's it's a uh, it's not exactly energy but it's but it's related to the energy and then across the top there there are color bars and that shows where the human eye sees the different colors uh, from uh, from violet on the left through blue orange yellow etc to to red um, and there are different materials that you may be familiar with on this plot here. Uh, in the green kind of line there is just normal green paint. Um, and that reflects, the y-axis there is, is reflected light. That reflects more light in green, uh, the green part of the spectrum, than in other parts of the spectrum that we can see. So we see it as green. Uh, the red brick there, similarly, reflects more light in the I'm pointing at the screen, and this, is, this probably looks silly to you. I, I know what I'm pointing at here. Um, the, the red brick reflects more uh, in the red than in other parts of the spectrum, so there, too, it, it looks red. Uh, the two other kind of materials you might uh, be familiar with, the white marble on the top and the gray shingle, those both are, are pretty uh, similar in that they reflect similar amounts of light across a lot of different colors, but the white marble reflects a lot more of the light than the gray shingle. Um, so we also have two asteroids on here, um, Vesta and Ceres. Vesta was the first target for Dawn, uh, and that's shown the blue line there. And then Ceres is the black line way down there at the bottom. So uh, Ceres, to the eye, uh, would appear basically pretty pretty black. It is, it's reflecting most, uh, most colors more or less the same and reflecting not a lot of that light. Um, so this doesn't tell us a whole lot about, about the composition in, in this wavelength range. So if you could show the next one that talks about the IR, the spectrum explanation IR, uh, and when you go beyond what the human eye can see, we have instruments that can, that can measure out kind of at, at almost any wavelength we want, and now we start to get some more information that we can interpret more easily. Um, you start to see kind of what, what we spectroscopists affectionately mostly call the, the bumps and wiggles out here. Um, Vesta now shows a couple of broad dips. Um, and if you look at the y-axis at about 0.9 micrometers and about 2 micrometers. And we know from looking at other materials, both here on Earth and in the laboratory, that that means there's specific kinds of rock out there, specific... Um, minerals like olivine and pyroxene. Um, you can also use this for some of the other materials. The green paint, for instance, has little dips at about 1.7 micrometers. That's probably due to organic material, some kind of fixer in the paint. And at 2.3 microns, there's another dip there that's probably due to clay minerals. Again, that's a, that's a fixer in the paint or, or something that's used in the paint. Um, through these wavelengths, series, you're still not really getting too much. It's still pretty flat. Um, so that still doesn't help us. So we have to move even further for series, um, uh, as opposed to most uh, asteroids like Vesta. So we had a, a good sense of what Vesta was made of 10 or 15 years ago when, when these sorts of measurements were made. Um, I don't know if Katie wants to jump in and talk about Vesta meteorites as, as another part of that. I can. It might be a good point because uh, I can take you up to the same spot or I can take everybody else up to the same spot you did, which is, you know, sort of right up to why we're interested in series. Great. Not um, so, great. So uh, if you want to show my first slide. Um, so for the first slide, I just wanted to show people sort of to first order why we care about meteorites in the first place, other than the fact that they're from space. So obviously, who wouldn't want to study them for a living? Um, but there are two primary reasons, or rather two different types of meteorites that give us information. Um, so one type of meteorite, for example, meteorites that are solid iron metal, um, they tell us what planets were like in the early solar system. So uh, many of our meteorites are actually bits of things like the Earth's core, except unlike the Earth, they didn't survive, they got broken up, and we get the pieces today. Um, but there's a second type of meteorite, I mean, these are broadly called chondrites, and they're of particular interest because they tell us what the solar system was like at the very earliest stages. So the meteorite I have there um, in the picture is 
called Allende. It fell in Mexico in 1969. And you can see there's sort of a black, almost cement, what we call matrix. Um, and within that matrix are a lot of uh, round spherules, which we call chondrules, um, a lot of weird shaped white things, gray things, and all sorts of other uh, fascinating inclusions. Um, but the reason why meteorites like Allende are you know, important is because the sort of white or gray blobs tell us what we think the solar system was like at the very, very earliest stages. So right as the sun was forming, right as rocks started to form in the solar system. So that's sort of what, you know, how we learn about the very earliest stages of how planets form. And the chondrules, which are the circular uh, so minerals like olivine and pyroxene that Andy was talking about in his spectra, uh, we think those tell us about processes that are happening somewhere in uh, the disk of gas and dust out of which planets form. But depending on who you ask, they mean different things and come from different places. Uh, and then finally, the matrix, which is the black material that makes up a lot of these rocks. Uh, we think it comes from farther out in the solar system, but we really don't know that much about it because uh, it's very fine-grained. And you know, when things, you know, when planetesimals grow, like Vesta or Ceres, and get big, uh, those really fine-grained materials are sort of the first things that end up being changed and altered. Uh, so if you want to go to the second slide. Um, this just gives you an idea of the specific sort of asteroids, or meteorites rather, I'm interested in, and the ones that uh, we might start thinking about when we go to Ceres. And um, like Andy was saying before, uh, Ceres looks mostly black. And as you can tell from the three pictures there, uh, those meteorites are also pretty much black. Uh, not too much there. And the differences between those types of meteorites are how much water we think melted and interacted, or how much ice melted and water interacted with the rocks as they were floating around in space. So uh, not weathering when they land on Earth, not anything that happened yesterday or even 100 million years ago. Uh, all this stuff happened you know, four and a half billion years ago when the solar system was forming. And so that's my particular interest, is sort of thinking about what water and rocks are doing uh, when planets are forming. So this slide here gives you uh, sort of our metric for how we classify uh, meteorites based on how much water is interacted with them. So at the far right, uh, under green, you see Allende. Uh, and that sort of mineral inset there is a mineral called uh, olivine, which again, Andy mentioned. And uh, olivine is pretty much what makes up most of the Earth's mantle and makes up a lot of uh, other meteorites as well. Um, and uh, the second sort of meteorite in the middle there under the aqua or cyan is a, what we call a type 2 meteorite, and that meteorite is called Murchison, which landed in Australia in 1969. So between Allende landing, Murchison landing, and the Apollo missions to the moon, uh, people had a pretty exciting year that year. Uh, but in that case, we actually can see minerals like the mineral on the inset there called serpentine, uh, which might you might also know as asbestos. And we know that forms when uh, water and rock interact at lower temperatures. And then finally, at the very left there, uh, in, under the dark blue, is what we call a type 1. And those meteorites are almost completely altered. We don't even see chondrules anymore. Uh, they're just balls of black clay. And uh, again, you can see sort of the inset there for uh, one of the minerals that's pretty prominent. And that meteorite uh, that's shown there, it's called Orgay, and it fell in France uh, in the 1800s. So uh, even way back when, people were studying it and trying to understand what it meant and where it came from. And ironically enough, we still don't actually know. Uh, but that's pretty much the spectrum you have there from things like Allende, which we think preserve all those different components from nearby the sun, you know, at the very earliest stages of the solar system, up until what water and rocks are doing together on, you know, bodies, maybe like Ceres, and, you know, down through things that have, you know, been completely altered. Uh, so that's kind of where Andy and I tie in together is, 
Um, for example, how we learned that we have meteorites from Vesta. People, you know, like Andy measured the spectrum in space, and uh, people like me took meteorites in the lab and measured the spectra, and they're exactly the same. So, can't quite do that with series yet, but that's why uh, it's really interesting to actually go there and get a better look. So, yeah, this is one of the few places in astronomy where we can physically sample the things that we're looking at, right? Is that we actually can get samples, but for series, we don't have any samples that, that we know of. Yeah. So we're just using the, 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 the light, so we're using spectroscopy, which is a, a very powerful way of finding out what things are made of, to look um, to look to see what it's made of. Uh, of course, at this point in the story, we haven't learned much from the, the optical and the IR spectrum. We're just getting a very flat spectrum, a very dark object. Yeah. And lots of ideas from meteorites of what might be there, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what, what it could possibly be. Um, I want to remind you guys watching, this is the series series, Dawn Hangout, Great Expectations. We're learning about uh, how we find out uh, how we're, what we know about series so far from, uh, from spectroscopy and uh, what we think we know about asteroids from meteorites that we have here uh, that have hit Earth. Uh, and so uh, there are a couple ways you can ask questions. Um, please use, feel free to use the Twitter at NASA underscore Dawn. Um, you can ask uh, questions there. I know Whitney and Judy are watching that. Um, uh, we have a link that I've added to the event page, which I will, um, it's not on, I can't share links as well on the YouTube, but I've included on the event page, uh, where there is a, um, a brief survey. I don't know if we want to talk about that now or save that to the end, Whitney. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll 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 save that till till the end. But we'll want we'll to let you guys know that link is there because um, we're doing a survey and a giveaway uh, at the end here. So uh, be sure to look for that link. Um, and uh, please use the event page for comments and YouTube page for comments as well. Um, so uh, I don't know, Katie, if you had uh, another point you wanted to to make right away, or do we want to move back to Andy on on this this spectrum mystery? No, I think going back to Andy is perfect at this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, the spectra that I was showing before out to 2.5 micrometers, that's the most common spectral region. Uh, when asteroid spectra are taken, that's, that's usually how far we go out. There's a lot of instruments that can do it. It's very convenient. But it hasn't given us much for series. So there are instruments that can get us a little bit further. So uh, this would be the series spectrum uh, file, plot, image, thing. Sorry, I'm a bit slow on the internets today. Not, <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. So this just so series alone, and it takes uh, the wavelength region uh, from the previous plots, it expands it a little bit further out to the right, and it really zooms in on the y-axis. So um, you can see that we're talking about differences of, you know, uh, where it will reflect 7% of the light instead of 9% of the light. So we're, we're really talking about uh, really stretching the image, as, as uh, stretching the, the colors, so to speak. Um, and it turns out that there is a little bit in there, um, if you really stretch it out. Uh, we see, um, again, at about one to one and a half micrometers, there's kind of a dip there. We think that's due to oxidized iron. Maybe something like uh, magnetite uh, is the, the mineral that uh, that people might be familiar with on Earth. Um, although, as I'm not a rock hound, I don't know how familiar people might be. I think magnetite is the, the black little specks if you go to the beach uh, and you, you have a handful of sand. I think the little black specks are magnetite. Um, there's a gray region, um, and it's a very important region. Um, that's where you find uh, absorption features and these, these bumps and wiggles due to water. Um, and unfortunately, because of water in the Earth's atmosphere, it's very hard to, to get that data. Uh, in that gray region, we actually had to use uh, data from a, a satellite in space to get that. Um, and we do see evidence of OH um, on Ceres, probably like these kinds of clays that uh, Katie was talking about in, in some of these meteorites. And then there are a couple of other features in here again. Some uh, brucite there is a magnesium hydroxide, um, and that's uh, something that's uh, not really found much in the meteorites, but we do certainly seem to find it on, on Ceres. And then two other features that we 
think are due to carbonate minerals, um, which makes Ceres one of only a few places where we've found carbonates, uh, I think other than Earth and Mars, it's Ceres. Um, so this, this starts to let us put together an idea of what is present on the surface of Ceres, and then that lets the, the geochemists go ahead and say, okay, how do you make these things? Um, what kind of, what kind of uh, environment do you have to have to make something like brucite, to make things like carbonates? Um, and also, you know, to go back and rule out, okay, it doesn't look like Vesta. We think we know what happened on Vesta. There was some kind of, some sort of, you know, melting of rocks and, and maybe some lava coming out. Um, and we don't see those minerals on, on Ceres, so that suggests that, that that didn't happen on Ceres. Again, consistent with what we see in the meteorites, at least some of the meteorites. Um, but we are pretty sure we don't have meteorites from Ceres itself, so we're missing that that uh, that link that we had for Vesta to be able to say, you know, to put it all together. So, so Dawn is really going into new, uh, new territory in that sense. So Andy, just a really quick question. Um, why is it so exciting and so different that Ceres has all this stuff in the IR? How does it compare to other asteroids? Um, there are... Um, the the meteorites uh, that that uh, Katie's been talking about the carbonaceous chondrites um, that have these these dark clays um, they don't really have uh, things like the brucite or a lot of the carbonates I guess they'll have some um, what we think formed these minerals on Ceres is that there had to have been a lot of water and that that water um, Interacted with with the minerals in a way to form to form the, the brucite and the carbonates. Uh, we think that the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites uh, have been pretty much left alone um, since they formed. There hasn't been uh, a lot of real large scale uh, chemical reactions going on. That they're they're more or less as they were. Um, for Ceres, we think it's much more consistent with a body that. Um, had a lot of water available to interact with a lot of uh, a, a lot of rock. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, and, and it's also interesting because conversely, we see no real evidence for ice at the surface of Ceres. Uh, Ceres is just way too warm to keep ice at the surface, but there's all this evidence from uh, observations by Hubble and and theoretical. Uh, work that there's a lot of ice in Ceres, so that creates this interesting paradox. We think there's a lot of ice there, we don't see any at the surface. Um, how that's going to translate into into what we find when we show up there is uh, still very much an open question. Yeah, that's a, that's an idea that that was really bizarre for me last time we talked about this because you think of icy bodies being in the outer solar system, moons around the the giant planet, the gi gas giants, or uh, out in the Kuiper belt. You don't expect to find something like that, not only in the asteroid belt, but the largest member of the asteroid belt. Yeah. And yet it's yeah. Yeah, I mean, we even just know from from density arguments. Um, that the density of Ceres is 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 low. It's it's uh, it it has a density that suggests it's about one third ice by mass. And um, certainly, fifteen or twenty years ago, and when, when you know we started grad school, or some of us started grad school, <laughs> um, the the idea was that there wasn't really much ice interior to Jupiter, um, okay. and there's been a lot of work. From from dynamics and uh, and a lot of at least some evidence that a lot of material has has really moved around in the solar system and at least one one you know serious senior member of of the community suggested Ceres formed out past Neptune and got transported all the way in. I think that that um, the evidence is against that. He suggested it a few years ago, and I think evidence has, has mounted since then that it's that it's not the case, but uh, it, it really has appeared to be a fish out of water. Um, <laughs> no, well, no pun intended there. Um, there. There do seem to be other large asteroids that have similar spectra to Ceres. We don't have nearly as much data 
But if if you follow the chain of logic and you say, okay, Ceres' surface is the way it is because of its history, and its history is that it has this big ice shell over a rocky core, then you might you might think this has happened a few times in the largest asteroids. Mm-hmm. Um, and that starts to then make Vesta look like like the odd the odd duck. Yeah, so Katie, you must have some perspective on that because part of the reason that we thought that way back when, when Andy was, was mentioning at the beginning of, of his grad school days, was because of uh, was because of meteorite studies, right? Was that we were kind of forcing forcing things into a rather small box, if it, as it were. So I was wondering if you would share some of that perspective. Yeah, no, I was actually going to say um, some of the things Andy brought up. Uh, I guess I don't know how the hangouts work. You can either bring up my third slide or I can just talk. But um, it's actually so. I think it was. Um, 19, well, actually, the first paper, so yeah, I, I can't do math right now. It's one thirty in the morning here. But anyways, yeah, um, sort of some of the stuff I'm working on is really thinking about, you know, what Andy said, right? Okay, we think that nothing much has happened to these guys. They're from smaller bodies, and things haven't moved around that much. Um, and really thinking about how true that is. Uh I think it was suggested a couple of decades ago that there could be fluid flow on these bodies, and now people think that they might convect. And uh, you know, really, what do the meteorites say, and how can we sort of use meteorites to constrain some of these models? Um, so this picture is uh, a picture from a billion-dollar instrument called a synchrotron. So there's one of those in Australia. And um, it also happens to have the one detector in the world that can uh, map elements across a whole meteorite section. So this is a section of a meteorite, and it can basically scan along this guy in a couple of hours and get trace elements and all sorts of other interesting chemical facts. Uh, But this is a map that's created by combining um, the distribution of several elements. So green is iron, and red is nickel, and blue is chromium. And so what you notice right away in Degrano, uh, which is sort of like Allende, the meteorite I was, t- the carbonaceous chondrite, thank you, Andy, that I was talking about earlier. We think Degrano is kind of stable, one of the not too altered meteorites. Uh, but even here you can tell, well, number one, that the nickel, which is the red, is obviously moving around. Um, and it's moving around in the same direction. So the sort of a blob at the upper right-hand corner is traveling, you know, roughly parallel to the two blobs that met just below it. Um, so uh, you wouldn't be able to, I mean, those differences in the elements are um, sort of hundreds of parts per million, so it's really hard to kind of detect those differences any other way. And you can tell also right away that there's unaltered material here, so things that are still very heterogeneous and kind of broken up, but also these you know, veins of altered material that's been fairly homogenized. And, um, you know, this is something that we obviously didn't really expect to see when we decided to, you know, see what meteorites look like with this new technique. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, which is one of the meteorites that um, we think altered at lower temperature, so the serpentinite uh, type ones. Um, and so when Andy was talking about uh, carbonate and brucite and meteorites that have hydroxyl groups or water attached to them, uh, Murchison is the exact sort of meteorite you'd want to be thinking about because this is the meteorite that has lots of carbonate in it. Um, it has minerals similar to brucite, although not exactly, and it definitely has a lot of OH groups. And uh, this uh, is a very similar image to the one before, except blue is zinc this time. Uh, but um, you can see again, uh, there's uh, very different sorts of textures that you can see in these elements at very, very fine scale. And the reason why uh, it's not more obvious is because it's at such low temperature to begin with, and you know these meteorites are, you know, basically fine-grained. Uh, completely black, right? So much like spectroscopists have a really hard time with things that, with spectra that have no features that look pretty black and flat, we have a really hard time with meteorites that are very, very fine-grained, 
you know, that are really hard to, you know, sample and prepare and look at. And so what this image is showing you is that you kind of have the spongy texture that's brighter green, uh, but then you also have uh, textures that seem to be showing uh, you know, more discrete detail in uh, things like iron and also around uh, the big black spots, which um, are not empty spaces. They're minerals like olivine, for example. So olivine is also present in these guys. Um, but you can see that there's sort of elements moving between uh, larger rock pieces and uh, whatever water rock mixture uh, they sat in at some point in time. Um, so I guess what I just wanted to show you uh, with those two is, you know, one of the things we're really starting to think about in meteorites lately is, uh, you know, what sort of object did they come from and, uh, you know, could they be from something like Ceres that's big? What do we really know about the material that makes up Ceres? Uh, are they from uh, something that's, you know, much smaller like we thought, you know, a couple decades ago? Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess it's just, what's interesting to me is just like uh, sort of all of these different communities with, you know, the missions that are going out and all the new technologies that are in context and, uh, you know, potentially revealing insight as to whether, you know, they were from, you know, much like iron meteorites, right, that are cores of internal objects that completely split up and were big at one time, is that the same thing with carbonaceous chondrites? Are they from big objects too? Or, you know, does the fact that the chemistry is so uniform mean that they had to be from smaller stuff and you know, you can just kind of go to bigger and bigger questions from there. Sorry about that, guys. I just dropped out briefly, and that, I don't know if that interrupted the broadcast, but we have everyone back. So uh, I just wanted to to say that these images were really awesome because it's this tiny, tiny, uh, tiny close-up look at some of the oldest things in the solar system, right? These are, these are the yeah. time capsules of the first things. Um, that formed in the solar system, and this is what we think that uh, Ceres may hold in store. Is that correct? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so Very my cool. favorite analogy for carbonaceous chondrites is that they're the vacuum cleaner dust bag. <laughs> so if you lived in your apartment and, you know, didn't vacuum for a long time and just kind of hung out there for a couple million years, and then somebody came and vacuumed up, and then, you know, a couple million know years later, like, no. it became a rock, and then you could dissect, you know, what you ate at all the different points in time. <laughs> so I kind of view carbonaceous chondrites as very similar to that. It's kind of like the vacuum cleaner bag from the whole solar system. Oh That's my god! Probably going up on social media. <laughs> <laughs> you know my know. vacuuming can... habits too well. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using caps. that analogy for a couple of years, and it hasn't stuck yet. So <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna make it happen because that is that is a really fantastic analogy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so what more? What more do we know about Ceres? Even though the spectrum is kind of difficult to see, we can only see these few percent changes, and we don't have a, you know, we, we aren't sure exactly which of these physical pieces it's most like. What else, what else do we know about Ceres so far? Uh, anyone? <laughs> anyone? <laughs> well, sure. We have... Um... Um, as 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 noted, you know we we mm -hmm. have uh, a, a decent shape model and a decent density for series. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, the given that you know people with with computers can can just go and run all sorts of directions, right? So uh, starting with the kind of starting material we think series would have begun with and and would have begun in the asteroid belt, you can. You can go forward and say, okay, you have so much radioactive material, which means you have so much heat being generated, which means that the temperatures get so high, which means etc. Um, and so that's why we have this. Um, that's why we have this idea that that Ceres has a kind of an icy shell, 
over uh, Rocky Core, um, and and yet um, I think I mentioned this. I, it's the, the surface of, of series is too warm to have to maintain ice, um, and yet we think we have this ice really close to the surface. So you can you can end up uh, with this situation where ice may be lurking just a few meters before the, b below the surface, um, but the surface itself really can't have a lot of ice. It's the uh, Mars of the asteroid belt. <laughs> yeah, in a sense, yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, you know, by far the biggest object out there. It has like a third of the mass of the asteroid belt all by itself. Um, so... so we, sorry. Um, I just... Uh, we, uh, Andy, what... what what instruments do you use? So we have Dawn that's on its way there, but what instruments have you been using to get these spectra of series? Uh, a lot of, of well, the spectra of series that that uh, I've, I've been showing, and uh, most of the asteroid spectra we take these days come from uh, the Spex instrument on the IRTF, um, and I'm uh, sure exactly. somewhere lurking around there you have a. Uh, a picture of, of that. Is that what Brittany's showing? Yeah. That's yeah. what Brittany's showing, yeah. Um, and uh, it's on the top of Mauna Kea, which is the best uh, observing site. Um, it's generally considered the best observing site in the world. Some other places might argue. Uh, but that, that silver dome there is, is the IRTF. Um, this is looking north. So Maui is the, the island in the distance there. Um, and... Uh, we use a spectrograph called Specs. It's been online for the last since about 2001, 2002, um, and uh, it's going for an upgrade now. And it's supposed to come back next year, even even better than better than before. So up Mauna Kea is is a fairly extreme environment. I haven't been there myself, um, but do you have you visited there, or, and or where do you normally observe from? Uh, I have been there a lot. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was good for the frequent flyer miles. But uh, it's at 14,000 feet, so it's not great conditions for, you know, thinking <laughs> or breathing uh, or much of that. The sky is beautiful up there. But uh, for the past sort of six or seven years, they have remote observing capability. So I actually sit right here where I'm sitting now, uh, usually, uh, although I'm wearing my robe at the time when I'm observing nowadays. And I figured I'd put on... <laughs> I figured I'd put on a shirt for you guys, at least. Um, so you're the Arthur Dent of astronomy, basically. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, I don't usually bring a towel, though. But, um, but that, that's been working well, and that, that's kind of a win-win in general, because uh, it saves NASA and NSF money if you can do it from, from, your, uh, from your, your, your desk or, or wherever you are. And, um, and it... it kind of saves on time because now instead of making it a long trip where it takes a day to get out there and you have to acclimate for a day mm -hmm. and then it's not worth getting less than two nights of time of observing at a time uh, you can really fit in and say okay you know I only need two hours just give me two hours hours roll yourself so yeah um, this is sort of the standard thing I look at so this is a rock from space uh, scientist style I guess um, but uh, I use a lot of electron microscopes, so they're microscopes not like the ones you're used to thinking about for biology, for example, but, uh, you know, half a million to a million dollar machines with uh, fancy new optics and field emission guns and uh, I don't even remember what the detectors are made of, some other new... Uh, ceramic. Um, but long story short, in the last decade, they've come out with a whole new type of instrument. So uh, if people work really hard, they can see, you know, like I was saying, the carbonaceous chondrites are nanoscale. So basically, an atom, so basically, most of the grains in Murchison, for example, are 10 atoms across. Uh, so these instruments can actually image things that size. Um, and there's all sorts of other new techniques, and that's actually one of the nice things about uh, moving to Perth, which is in Western Australia, which for those that don't know, uh, is largely supporting Australia's economy due to the mining industry. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of 
research capability, a lot of instruments, a lot of geologists, a lot of expertise, and um, one of the things I really, uh, you know, enjoy doing here is, uh, you know, trying to talk to those people from different backgrounds and see what I can apply from, you know, sort of their knowledge about how walk, water and rocks interact to form a gold deposit or, you know, an iron formation and see what that tells us about meteorites. So that's one of the, you know, benefits uh, that was unexpected about uh, moving to Australia about a year and a half ago, I guess. Very cool. So, so now you're you're using this expertise from from Earthbound geology, and we can go back to space for a bit about where I think we talked a little bit about where carbonaceous chondrites come from and what they are. Maybe you can expand a little on, on that concept. Yeah, um, I think it's slide five is the one I uh, I sent you. Sure. Um, and part of this slide was just me being really fascinated by just how much we've learned in the last couple of decades, uh, but. The point of it can be summarized as there are a lot of theories about where carbonaceous chondrites come from, but we still really don't know. So depending on who you ask, and I would say it's at least 75, 25 probably, uh, some people think they come, you know, or uh, we know a lot of them come from the asteroid belt, but carbonaceous chondrites themselves, you know, are they asteroids, right? Are they something like Ceres, for example? Um, or uh, a lot of people think that they could be comets. So, uh, yeah, in this case, it was. I just thought it was really neat that in 1974, that's what we thought of as a comet. And now, thanks to uh, Stardust, which was the mission that brought back pieces of a comet, um, we have a much better idea of what they look like. And actually, when we look at those little grains from a comet, they're grains of things in meteorites. So, uh, you know very similar, I guess, in terms of, you know, the minerals you might expect in a carbonaceous chondrite. And then um, I think Brittany mentioned this in the last uh, episode of the series series uh, that uh, recently it's been discovered that, you know, there are main belt asteroids. So asteroids in, you know, what we think of as, you know, stereotypical orbits, but they have ice in them. And if they get hit by an impact or uh, something else happens to them, and um, you know they look like a comet would, except unlike comets, which go you know out to Jupiter or out into the Oort cloud and then back towards the Sun, uh, these guys just kind of hang out, you know, in their standard orbit and uh, still uh, display this evidence for water. So it really kind of blurs the lines of what's an asteroid in the first place and what's a comet in the first place. Um, that, that's interesting because I was just. Um at DragonCon and get got the question, of course, what makes a planet not a planet, you know, what makes it a dwarf planet, and I ex explained there's a continuum of objects, and it seems like it's kind of the same thing in, in asteroids and comets. There's a continuum or, or not a strict delineation of ice. Yeah, I planets. think, uh, I'll wait, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I think more stuff is getting filled in in between, mm -hmm. and, you know, like even with Ceres, thinking of it as a body with a lot of ice on it, but you know, as I think Brittany and Andy mentioned, it's this perfect sphere. So we usually think of planets differentiating as iron goes to the center and then there's a mantle, but you know now there's this idea that you know a rock is a core and the ice is the mantle and then what's the crust of something that's a water rock differentiated object. Yeah. And so, yeah. Andy, do, can you, um, do we have evidence of, of water ice or ice on other asteroids uh, other than Ceres? Funny, funny you should ask. <laughs> um, uh, we, we do and in fact it's related to the main belt comets that Katie just mentioned. Um, a, a little further out from uh, the sun than where Ceres is, so Ceres is at like 2.7 times the Earth's distance from the sun. Uh, when you get out to like 3.1, 3.2 times Earth's distance, you can start to have ice be um, stable at the surfaces for a little while of, of some objects, and we did find a couple years ago on a, uh, an asteroid called uh, Themis, asteroid number 24, um, evidence of ice on its surface, an ice frost. 
Um, uh, and Themis is part of an asteroid family, so uh, the original body was was maybe about half the size of Ceres. It got pounded by a big impact, and, and Themis itself is the largest, uh, the asteroid 24 is the largest remaining remnant. Um, and some of the other smaller members are actually some of these main belt comets. So it all hangs together that that the original body had had plenty of ice, or at least had enough ice, uh, that that it, it exists today on the surface of Themis and as some of these main belt comets. Um, we've also seen ice a little further out uh, from Themis, so out at, you know, once once you get out to 3.3, 3.4, 3.5 or 3.5 times the Earth's distance, um, you we, we see ice more commonly on those objects. And then, of course, once you get far enough out to the distance of Jupiter, uh, the Jovian satellites, which are not asteroids, things like Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, those all, it, it's plenty cold, you can have ice on their surfaces, and we do see that. Yeah, but uh, Ceres being so close, it's it's not sure whether it's on the surface or not, and so I think you have some graphics I wanted to show about where this ice could possibly right. be on the surface. Sure, yeah. Um, why don't you show the one called um, Lag Deposit? Sure, do that. So Ceres has a uh, very low obliquity, which is the, the angle between um, its orbit and its pole. Uh, the Earth's uh, obliquity is 20-something degrees, 22, 23 degrees, um, and that's why we have summer and winter. Uh, Ceres' uh, obliquity is almost zero, so it doesn't really have much in the way of seasons. Um, but it also means that very close to its pole, uh, you can you can potentially keep ice. We don't have the angular, we don't have the, the resolution, the spatial resolution to see, and again, I'm doing this thing with the hands, um, to, to see if there's ice near the poles of Ceres or not. Uh, Dawn will definitely get that information. For the rest of... Uh, for the rest of Ceres, closer to its equator, it's it's too warm to really keep ice around for very long. So we think what might have happened is is one of a couple things, like uh, in this this plot here. So when Ceres formed and it differentiated, like Katie said, we think maybe into ice an ice mantle over a rocky crust. Um, the very top of Ceres uh, would still potentially be rock, and that would be heavier than the ice. So we think that would kind of sink down through the ice and the water. That would put the ice on top, but you can't really keep the ice on top because it's too warm for the ice. So that ice would then start to sublime away. Um, it, you know, uh, for those non-scientists out there, basically evaporate, but evaporate means something technically different. So it's about start to sublime away and 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 leave whatever kind of maybe collected in the ice behind. So we think that would be one way you'd get sort of these brucite and carbonate minerals at the surface of Ceres um, is by leaving what we call a lag deposit. The ice would go away and, and leave whatever junk had collected in the ice behind. Um, so that's uh, that's one possibility. Uh, the second possible way of getting this these brucite and carbonate on the surface would be the other plot, which is uh, cryovulcanism. Um, cryovulcanism is a... Uh, kind of specific term, um, which basically means volcanism, except you use ice for the magma and the lava instead of rock like we see on volcanoes here on Earth. Um, and here the idea would be that you kind of have still a rocky crust, or some kind of crust, but if you, if you manage to punch holes in that via either impacts or just the natural extensional stresses that you'd find, you might get ice to come up through that hole and kind of have an icy magma, uh, an icy lava, and then you have the same situation where the ice maybe drags stuff up with it. It's too warm to keep the ice on the surface, so the ice goes away and leaves the stuff it dragged behind. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to uh, determine which of those two things is going on on series. Um, Certainly, when Dawn shows up, it'll give us a lot more, a lot more data, a lot closer uh, images, and um, hopefully that'll that'll help us out. Yeah, again, cryovolcanism is something that um, you you see much more on the the moons um, of the outer solar system, and so that's again a really interesting concept that we could find it in the asteroid belt so close to us. Yeah, Ceres is in a lot of ways a lot like a. Uh, 
like the icy satellites of the of the outer planets, it's just not orbiting anything. It's 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 uh, intermediate. Yeah, it's 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 larger than Enceladus. It's between Enceladus and Tethys in size. So it's it's the right size to, to have some of this stuff going on that that some of the icy satellites have. It's uh, it's kind of free range, you know, on, on its own. <laughs> it's doing its own thing. That's right. Yeah, very cool. Um, so we are close up on an hour. I wanted to um, go over a couple of um, points. Uh, first, I'll have Whitney talk about the survey. Then I'll go over some of our upcoming hangouts. And then I would like to end on Andy and Brittany and Katie, our our experts here, to tell us a little bit about uh, maybe what they're most excited about seeing um, when Dawn gets to series. So first, I'll start with um, Whitney. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about the survey, I think you need to unmute yourself quickly. So I had a couple of things I wanted to share out from sure. Don EPO. Um, one thing is that we would love to have your feedback on um, Google Hangouts, what you'd like to see uh, that has, you know, that are related to the Don mission and um, both, you know, what we are learning because the science at Vesta is ongoing. Um, our scientists are still pouring over the a massive amount of amazing data we glean from that. Um, you as citizen sciences can participate in some of that through our Asteroid Mapper Citizen Science Project that we've uh, developed with CosmoQuest. Um, so, um, but also, of course, we're thrilled and excited to be headed to Ceres and uh, cruising now um, quietly but swiftly through the main asteroid belt for that great um, uh, dwarf planet. So. We have a very simple survey, and what we'd like to do is invite you to take it. It'll take five minutes or less of your time. Um, just give us a little feedback and direction on what things you'd like to hear. And in return, we will send you one of our beauteous Dawn calendar. Or Katie and Andy have both already signed up for one, so <laughs> we're sending them as a thank you present for their awesome participation today. Um, so let me give you, I'm going to go ahead and let's see. See if I can screen share this. Um, cool. Uh, I've put the link on the event page in the comments, and I've also put a somewhat butchered version of the links in the YouTube comments since they don't allow direct links. So perfect. You can check perfect. those as well. Yeah. Right, and I will certainly post on Facebook and all that kind of good stuff. Excellent. So um, here we go. Here's our link. Um, so um, it's, we got a bit.ly link there because that this link is about two feet long. Um, That's much easier. Than right. When I typed in. <laughs> You've got it there, and we are we'll um, also post it in all those other good places. And the last little bit I wanted to make sure you're aware of is that um, we have some wonderful blogs um, that are part of the the Dawn mission, and. Um, we both have we have a Doc, Mark Raymond's Dawn Journal, which comes out every month, and he really started that at the beginning of the mission. And we have a new science blog, and we love luring people like Katie and Andy to to uh, write pieces for that. And we also have some of our educational pieces that are going to be coming up. So we have um, the science blog as well as Dawn Journal as opportunities for you to engage with us. And of course, face, uh, social media. We love to hear from you. So that's that's it for me. Over on CosmoQuest, we're, we're also working on an educational unit for uh, middle school teachers to use uh, that goes along with the, the Asteroid Mappers project. It's called Investigate. We'll come up. I, love it. I love the pun. I did not come up with that, sadly. Um, uh, we, we previewed some of it at DragonCon in Atlanta, Georgia this past week, as well as showed people the Asteroid Mappers uh, uh, interface and had them marking craters right there at, at a sci-fi fantasy convention, which was really fun, uh, showing them how bizarre and weird that world is. And so we're um, excited to have you guys as part of the citizen science. And if you're, especially if you're an educator, look forward to the. Um, you know, Dawn already has some really great educator resources, and we'll be coming up with some new ones as well at CosmoQuest. Um, as far as hangouts are concerned, we have. Uh, the Weekly Space Hangout is tomorrow at noon Pacific, so uh, again, apologies to all those that we missed last week because Fraser was at PAX and I was at Dragon Con and the Hangout got lost in the, in the shuffle. So we'll come back with two weeks worth of space news for you guys tomorrow at noon Pacific. And then Sunday is the virtual star party. I think they're going to shoot for 8.30 Pacific. It's starting to get earlier as um, the Northern Hemisphere heads closer to autumn. 
So uh, we thank you for joining all our Hangouts and uh, for joining this one, specifically the very special series series. Uh, and now I'd like, like I said, I'd like to end with all of our, our, our experts, Andy and Brittany and Katie, if they can each give us a little bit of what they're excited, most excited about for seeing uh, when Dawn gets to series in, in early 2015. So I'll start from the left again, Andy. Uh, um, well, I guess selfishly, since I've written a few papers on series recently, I'm I'm hoping to find out that all the papers are right. <laughs> of course, because <laughs> yeah, you never really know. But um, I think it's uh, I think it's going to be a great target. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how something that um, you know all our evidence is that there's a a lot of ice there probably real close to the surface, and to see how that plays out in terms of the geology of the surface, how it plays out in terms of, um, of you know, what, what we can learn about the, the, the history based on, you know, where it keeps craters, where it doesn't keep craters. There's a lot of, of work that's been done on, on how a warm, icy body will retain or lose geological uh, features. So I think, I think that's what I'm looking for, looking forward to. Very cool. Brittany, I know we've we've heard you your excitement before, but I want to hear it again. <laughs> oh sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I I mean, I'm I am similarly excited for the surface geology. I think series is very different and very exciting in a lot of ways. Um, totally different from any place that we've been, and I'm looking forward to seeing how how strange that surface might be. Um, but I'm also really looking forward to the gravity data. Um, which is how, where we'll really know what series is made out of uh, in terms of you know its density its density distribution but really that's going to be the confirmation that that we've got an icy satellite right there so uh, or an icy you know something like the icy satellites but maybe they you know the only primary icy planet that's that's out there at least in a in within reach of the earth so that's what I'm really excited about very cool and Katie I know you you have series as well as some other stuff about linking meteorites and asteroids. Yeah. Oh, no, I can just uh, finish up. Uh, yeah, because sure. as I told Brittany, I made extra slides just in case. But um, in terms of what I'm excited about, I guess one is uh, I have a favorite mineral, chronstatite. Um, and it's, um, it's, ridiculously, it's ridiculously rare terrestrially, uh, but is the main mineral making up things like Murchison, so the uh, low temperature uh, meteorites. And I want to know if that's on the surface, uh, because it would be awesome. And um, the other thing, which I guess echoes what Brittany and Andy were saying, is uh, I guess um, and this can also serve as a why everybody should become a scientist story, is uh, on my paid vacation to Hawaii my first year of grad school, uh, I was working with, or somebody else was there who um, worked with the people from Cassini, so the Saturn mission, and we were there as Huygens was dropping down into Titan and seeing the pictures for the first time and not knowing what to expect and having what the pictures were be beyond what you could even imagine. So that's what I'm waiting for, is for Brittany to send me the unauthorized series pictures early. <laughs> and get oh, my can I get them too? <laughs> yeah, being like, could Never you have ever imagined? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, I can't wait to be astounded because it's just kind of how uh, every single step we take in space seems to go is we see something that we wouldn't have predicted, so. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, 2015, the year of the dwarf planet. We'll have Dawn getting to Ceres, and we'll have New Horizons getting to, to Pluto. So it's going to be pretty exciting. I, again, like I told the Dragon Con Space Track crowd this weekend, I'm excited to see brand new worlds for the first time because I, I wasn't around to see the Voyager missions. You know, hit those outer planets. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> to see those happen and first come in. So I'm excited for that. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you all so much uh, for joining. Uh, we have we have Whitney Cobb and, and Judy Conley, who's also <laughs> hanging out in the back, uh, helping us with the um, the hangouts and the comments and all that good stuff. Uh, Katie Dill, who joined us from the wee hours of the morning of Curtin University. So. 12 hours difference. Thank you again. <laughs> oh, and uh, let's go Buffalo. Please root for the Bills. If you don't have a football team, we need your help. <laughs> No comment, <laughs> says the Jets fan. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> sorry, sports ball. What's that? Uh, Andy Rifkin uh, for, for showing us these awesome spectra of series um, and and uh, the, the exciting work that's being done uh, from, from your living room. <laughs> from your living room and the top of Mauna Kea, which is fantastic. That's right. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Brittany Schmidt, once again, thank you so much. Uh, awesome, awesome job running these Hangouts and uh, helping us out with everything. So uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, please visit us at uh, CosmoQuest and visit the Dawn mission pages. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you, everybody. And